The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is All Things Elite. Welcome back to All Things Elite. Load up the pod, and it's on when we speak. Rich right here, let me warm it up for Austin and Floyd. Couldn't be no one but the boys. When it come to All Things Elite from the fan perspective, swear, man, it ain't no question. Hear from them first. Swear, man, they putting in the work. No, they had to get me for the verse. Social suplex network zone. I was at a time in your headphones. Austin and Floyd on the microphone. Backing out on the red, getting in the zone. Oh. Pulling up the show, give it seven stars, you already know Who else could it be but the show with the proclivity for a positivity, I'm gone Welcome to the 239th episode of Social Suplex's podcast about AEW with a proclivity for positivity. Welcome to All Things Elite. I am your host, Floyd Johnson, and with me uh, subbing in for Austin Summerwitz once again is Mr. J.R. Perez. He is the unofficial third member of All Things Elite. How are you doing today, J.R.? It is a very sunny and hot First of July here in the year 2024. I'm excited to be back after we did our preview so we can do our review of the third annual Forbidden Door. And happy Canadian Canada Day to all our Canadian listeners and followers. We thank you for listening. Um, I just just a quick program note. Uh, One Nation Radio and Keeping the Strong Side did a joint uh, review of... Um, the Forbidden Door, so make sure you check that out on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Then listen to our thoughts. I actually listen to most of their show, and I can honestly say I do have different... We're going to have, because we've had talked about this, we definitely have different thoughts and see things a little differently than what they did. So definitely want to listen to... I say support the p- podcast and listen to both shows. It was Jeremy uh, Donovan, uh, Rich Lotta, and... James Boyd recovering, uh, covering the show. And it was just great. Even the few seconds I got to listen to, actually a few minutes I got to listen to, got a, uh, a lot of thoughts on it. So, yes, I am putting over another Forbidden Door preview review before doing my own Forbidden Door review. Because that's how, I, how unique I think ours are. I think they both can stand on their own. And they are, you know, like we, we definitely are more of the fan side. They are, you know, the more critical you know, that kind of side of it. So let's go look go ahead and look at it. Um, make sure you're downloading this fine show on YouTube music or Apple podcasts. Please leave a rating and review. If you're so inclined, you can follow us on at, at AT elite pod on Twitter at social suplex is the host of our show at Austin Sumowitz. That's S Z U M O W I C Z and at Floyd Johnson jr. On Twitter, make sure you're checking us all and following everyone to keep up to date. When we new shows, uh, uh, yes, I am. The reason I'm doing this show with Jr. I love Jr. I love when he comes in. We basically do a review and a preview of every show without formally calling it that. But uh, we're trying. I'm trying to be more consistent, making sure we get a show out every week. Austin has had a lot of people out at work or whatever, so he's been covering. So he's been working. We're lots and lots of hours. That's my hard-working good friend, Austin Sumowitz. He should be back for the regular episode this week, but uh, JR has been kind enough and lovely enough to join us for the review. So we're going to start, and we're going to give our blanket overall thoughts on the pay-per-view. JR, I'm going to let you go first. I'm going to keep it very short and simple because, as you all know, I'm very long-winded. I feel like Forbidden Door from the match quality was really good. I felt about every match delivered as far as in-ring work. Um, the one of the things I think with Forbidden Door where I think it's it slowly has transitioned from year one in, in 2022 to now year three in 2024, to me this is the equivalent of the All-Star, All-Star Games or Pro Bowl, if you will. You have talent coming together from multiple organizations and showcasing what they have. So when you see the show, I think people are a lot of times going into it like, what are the storylines or what what's going to be the outcome of these matches? And, you know, there are some that are AEW driven. But I think in general, though, when you have AEW versus New Japan Pro Wrestling, AEW versus Stardom, 
or you have a combination like, for example, the match where you had the Elite versus the acclaimed and Tanahashi. It's just going to be, it's, it's an all star game. And that's how I look at it. I think starting now, moving forward, that's where we should come out to be. So I think individuals who are kind of a little bit overcritical of the show, I think we take a step back, look at that lens. I just see you see a different perspective from it. Yes, um, I definitely understand what you're saying. And, you know, we've talked about this to a point. I agree. Um, my overall thoughts on the show, it was a good to great show that was incredibly predictable. And I feel like this might be the first AEW show that I felt that way after watching it all. So we did our preview. And of the matches that we, in predictions, of the matches we predicted, I believe I only got one wrong, and that was the Elite. Uh, I don't remember what you said about the Elite, JR. Do you remember? I honestly, I, I think I may have said the Acclaim one was going to win. Yeah, so, I mean, because we largely agreed because... It felt kind of chalk, and you know, I was talking about on the preview that I was like, "Man, maybe Mina Shakira, Shir- uh, Mina Shirakawa, yeah, uh, could win and you know do something just to try to throw something in there because it was you know." So, like I said, match quality—that's what AEW does best. They had a lot of really good matches. I felt like there was no duds on the show or anything like that. There was no bad matches, but it was just like, it was incredibly chalk. And it's just, when people are talking about it and they're comparing it to other pay-per-views, and they're like, you know, I've heard, uh, we've talked about this, that we've heard the the varying uh, satisfactions. Greatest show ever. You know, this show sucked. You know, this show was mid. I feel like, you know, from my fan perspective, our fan perspective, like I said, I feel like it was a good to great show, but it was very predictive, predictable. So it was kind of like, I don't know if I got into all the matches because I just kind of was like waiting on it to get to the point because I already knew what happened. So I don't know. I will say this with anything in life, when you do something, when you were doing four four uh four um pay per views a year, it was it was special. Uh it was special, you know, and it was like you usually got four of the greatest pay per views you've ever saw in your life. And now then it went to six, and I think they still kept that quality. Now we're heading to nine. Where it's like, okay, you got, you used to be, you had double or nothing, and then you didn't have a show till all out. Now you have double or nothing, then a month later you have Forbidden Door, then, you know, like, within two months now, you have, uh, two months now you have all in, and then two weeks after that you have all out. If your TV is, like, first of all, the pay-per-views aren't going to be as good, because, you can do four really spectacular pay-per-views. Doing nine really spectacular pay-per-views is unlikely. And because you have to get ready for the next pay-per-view, your uh, you know, your TV might suffer a little bit as far as quality. So, I think we've seen both of those happen this year. I mean, I still think Dynamite's the best wrestling show on TV every week. I still think AEW puts on the best pay-per-views. Uh, pay for best pay per views, but I just feel like because of the sheer amount of TV that's available, that uh, sheer amount of TV and stuff that's available, that uh, you know, a quality the quality is going to suffer. But let's talk about the good things, don't want to talk about the bad things. 10,000 plus in uh, 10,000 plus in uh, the USB uh, US Bank Arena and uh, Long Island on Long Island. And then uh, over a million dollar gate. Don't you like? Do I know the exact numbers? No, but over a million dollar gate. So another successful show. Um, yeah, so that's good. But now we're gonna get into actually looking at each individual match. Uh, let me ask: Did you have a favorite match from the show, Jr.? 
if I had a favorite match from the show, I, for me, the two matches I was looking forward to, and I think they both delivered, um, Tony Storm versus Mina, and then the main event, Osprey and, and Swerve. Okay. Yeah, uh, Osprey and Swerve, definitely my favorite match on the card. My second favorite match was probably the ladder match, because I just love ladder matches. And then I thought, but I do think every match delivered. But like I said, even though predictable, it was uh, every match delivered. So we're going to go quickly through the show, uh, quickly through like the pre-show, and we'll stop when we have a lot of thoughts. First pre-show match was in a shocker, because I didn't think it was announced, or if it was announced, it was announced really uh, or, or like really like shortly before the show, we had Serpentico versus Kyle Fletcher, and this went exactly like a Serpentico versus Kyle Fletcher match is supposed to go. It wasn't like uh, it wasn't like they didn't reinvent the wheel. I think it lasted like three minutes, and Serpentico uh, lost to Kyle Fletcher. Sir, do you have any thoughts on this three minute match? I just feel like this was a, this match was done specifically for a foreshadowing that we're going to see Kyle Fletcher at the end of the night. Yes, and I do want to say um, I went. I uh, I'm in Oklahoma City. Uh, my friend Noel lives in Tulsa, and Noel often comes now when there or when there are shows here or WWE shows. He he drives the hour and a half to watch a show with me, and then uh, he drives an hour and a half to watch a show with me. So. Uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, return the favor. I was going to be in town and I drove an hour and a half, hour and a half to watch the show with him. So it's funny as Noel is a wrestling fan, big time wrestling fan. He's not as hardcore as us. So I heard a lot of thoughts during the show, uh, a lot of thoughts during the show that I don't normally hear. So I am going to be sharing a few of his thoughts because I just thought they were very interesting. So um, on this match, uh, Kyle Fletcher, because I bring this up because Kyle Fletcher ends the match and he does the brain buster on the turnbuckle to get the victory. Like he had already won with the tombstone. Then I guess because he had just lost his uh, ROH television title, which the commentary did a good job of putting over. He had a point to prove. So he had him beat after the tombstone. Then they did the, uh, the turnbuckle brain buster to get the win. Uh, then we had a four-way tag match. Now, okay, this match, surprisingly really high pop for me because as a person that loves tag team wrestling very much, love the Young Bucks, love FTR, love the Lucha Bros, like a low-key tag team that I absolutely love. And if you had given me, if you had given me the keys to the kingdom, Tony Khan's job, I would push the shit out of them. Is Malachi Black and Brody King. I love the Kings of the Black Throne. First of all, I love the name, <laughs> the Kings of the Black Throne. Uh, second of all, you know, they just have this monster look with all the tattoos and all that stuff. I was making the point last night, dude, if it was up to me, uh, Malachi Black and Brody King would wrestle mm -hmm. on Rampage every week against a different tag team and win in three minutes. They would just destroy people, and then I would put the tag belts on them, and then have them hold them, and then whoever you push to beat them, it would really mean something with the big step. But again, that's m me going off on a I love the Kings of the Black thro Throne tangent, so I'll stop that. Then we had uh, a couple New Japan AEW mixed tag teams. We had Kyle O'Reilly and Tomohiro Ishii. Then we had... Uh, Gabe Kidd and Roderick Strong. They also had a tag match on Rampage to lead to this. The last tag team we have is established AEW team private party. Isaiah Cassidy and Mark Quinn. Okay. This, in my tag team rule, you know who would be winning this match. Private party. But in the end, uh, private party looked for the silly spring. But House of Black were waiting for them with a flurry of offense. Brody blasted Zay with the Gonzo Bond and scored the pin. So my Kings of the Black Throne get the win. I'm hoping this leads to them getting a run as a tag team. JR, did you have any thoughts on this match? No, you know, consistently Malachi Black and, and the House of Black have put on great performance one after another. They were great trios champions. 
So I, I think you get to a point where, you know, what are you doing with these guys? You know, they're a heck of a, they're a, heck of a hand, both of them. Malachi Black is one of my favorite wrestlers I've got a chance to see. And I, I really hope that this is a springboard into something moving forward through the summer to give them something to seek their teeth into. They would, they would beat the Young Bucks, in my opinion. Like, I know what they're doing with the Elite right now, foreshadowing there, but... Damn, they would, they would, they would be the team, and they would beat them pretty decisively, <clears throat> because, like I said, it's the look, it's the moves, like you know the the uh, black uh, the kick, the gonzo uh, the gonzo bomb, everything they have going for them, is like why aren't you pushing this team as a team? Why haven't you pushed them as a team now? I mean, and of course, being in a tag team, from everything I've ever heard. Uh, you know, it saves both wrestlers because you know they got to wrestle less. So there you go. Um, then we're going to all right, Willow Nightingale and Tom Nakato versus Chris Statlander and Moto, Momo Watanabe. Uh, it's Tam, Tam Nakano and Momo Wa, Wa, Watanabe. I'm sorry, James, I, I got the names wrong. Mr. Joshi, don't get me. Um, uh, and you know, I just kind of talk about the end. Willow drilled Momo with the avalanche Death Valley driver, which looked impressive. Second rope Death Valley driver. I was like, man, that should be the finish. But Momo kicked out at two. Willow pounced Momo. Willow dropped Chris, drop kicked Chris, jumping off the apron. Apron. Tam had Momo all tied up and finished her with a hammerlock German suplex for the win. Now. That's the only thing. I think it was a straight jacket German suplex. So, um, uh, other than that, I thought this was a really solid match. Uh, both Willow and Chris are from Long Island, I believe. So they got to do it from the crowd, and I felt like it added heat to their eventual match. It was, and it was weird to me that neither one of them had anything to do with the pinfall, but I was okay with that. It, if it gave a chance to feature Starbin. Did you have any thoughts on this? No, actually, I think with, with this match, it, it did its job because um, they're as leading into Dynamite. We know they're going to face off from the Owen Cup. And it's one of those ones where this reminded me of those old, almost like Saturday Night Main Events, you know, specials going into a pay-per-view where you're trying to showcase these talent, but they don't necessarily touch or they don't get like get more involved in the, the decision. Because it's just like you have a super, super tag match. And that's what it did. It did what you need to do, showcase both ladies. But it's like, hey, it's business come Wednesday now. Yes, and we'll talk about Wednesday later. But it is stacking up to be like like a Dynamite 1.5. I wouldn't call it a pay-per-view card. But it's definitely a higher version of Dynamite. So make sure you're telling everyone you know to watch that. Uh, then we had a Women's Owen Hart Foundation Tournament quarterfinal. We had Soraya with Harley Cameron versus Mariah May with time, Timeless Tony Storm. She was wearing her curlers and had a jumpsuit on. I thought that was so cool because, you know, her match wasn't happening yet, so she didn't come out in full gear. She just came out in what she chills in before the match and then Luther the butler. Uh, so um, Soraya kind of dominated this match. Soraya, see, I just said it right, and then I came back and said it wrong. Soraya dominated the match, but... It, the wrap up is uh, Mariah smashed Soraya with a hip attack in the corner. Harley Cameron jumped on the ring gaper, but Tony Storm pulled Harley down. Soraya took advantage of the distraction and nailed uh, Mariah with a neck breaker. Uh, Mariah grabbed the ropes to stop the pinfall before the ref count to three. Mariah rolled up Soraya out of nowhere and pinned Soraya. Uh, yeah, so just out of nowhere, flash pin. Uh, Mariah May moves on over Soraya. Uh, I thought I, I thought it was fine. I, I, I didn't. I don't have like a lot of super hardcore thoughts on this match. I thought it was a match that happened. I thought Mariah Way was gonna win, and she won. You have any thoughts, sir? Yeah, this was the one where um, I know I got this one wrong because I forgot in the preview that the winner gets a shot at the champion at All In. So I had picked Soraya. But I forgot that if I would remember it, I would have picked Mariah because the thing with Mariah and Tony Storm and and you add in Mina, this is this is 
probably, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, definitely for the women's division, like the longest built-up story I think they've done in AEW when it comes to women's wrestling. And, you know, slowly, like, the you know we're we're you know they're dropping seeds because build this up throughout the summer because it's going to be pretty spectacular where they end up in my opinion absolutely <clears throat> excuse me i unmuted and then coughed that's how that's how tonight's going um now we move on to the next match the next match was the main event the main event of the uh, the pre-show, trios tag. We got Lij versus, which was Hiroma Takahashi, Teton, and Yoda Suji versus Mystico and the Lucha Bros uh, with Alex Abrahantes. Um Yeah, this match. I said those six people name, and and for the people listening to the show, y'all all hardcore, pretty hardcore fans. So you have an idea how this match would turn out, right? It was exactly what you thought this match was going to be. It was over the top. It was a lot of moves. It was a lot of flippings. And it was like, this is what you want out of the main event of a zero-hour match. So if you're on the fence about ordering the show and then you watch this match, how do you not drop to 50 bucks? JR, what did you think? No, I, I really did enjoy this match, and uh, it went. I remember it went exactly how you called it. You called Mystico, uh, Mystico over uh, Teton, and it was like that's what happened, and it was it was good. I actually hope to see Mix Mystico uh, on more AEW television down in the future. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, at the, at the end, uh, end of the match, Pender drilled Hiromu with a destroyer. Mystico splashed Hiromu. Teton wiped out Ray Phoenix with a flurry of offense, punctuated by a thrust kick. The Lucha Bros planted Hiromu with the fear factor. Mystico locked in La Mystica and forced Teton to tap out. So that was your zero hour. I, dude, zero hour is like the best episode of Rampage you ever saw, right? Like, I feel like Rampage should be zero hour every week. Well, yeah, because, you know, one of the things, and this is going from somebody um, that mentioned this when they about pay-per-views. When you have a preliminary show before the pay-per-view, the whole goal, goal of that preliminary show is to get last-minute pay-per-view buys. That's the only reason to have a preliminary show. And, you know, what they do is they put people on there. They know they're going to deliver matches, but they're not going to put on, like, a, you know, really, like, a big storyline-driven match on the pre-show because it's like, oh, we need them to pay 50 bucks. We want them to pay it, but we still want them to see, like, high-quality matches. And that's what they did. They put on between, you know, to me, the, the last two matches, Willow and and, and Sam versus... Um, Statlander and Momo, and then this one, this this six this trios match, it did what its job was: get them to watch, get them engaged, and be like, okay, I'm ready to drop fifty dollars. I, I tell you, I, I've done it when it comes to combat sports. I've turned on the preliminaries. I seen, I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll pay the money to watch this. Unfortunately, I am the sicko that this show is for, so they never have to sell me on ordering the show. <laughs> so, but for the casual viewers, it's like, how do you watch this and be like, you know what? I want to know what happens with the rest of this show. All right, now we're on to the main card. The opening match of AEW Forbidden to- Door 2024 was MJF versus Hechicero. MJF versus Hechicero, of course, M- uh, Hechicero, MJF's music comes out uh, and you know he he's fucking over he's god in long island and it sounded like it when he came out and again you know i listen to lots of podcasts cuz i you know i i feel like to me when you listen to podcasts you get lots of different points of view and someone on another podcast i believe it was joe lanes or rich it was on their show of voices of wrestling pointed out that mjf is very smart he knows what to do yes you're in a match with Hatcher's hero Pretty much everybody knows who's going to win the match, right? Hatch Stero runs the technical style. It's in it's in Long Island. Do you come out during the middle of the show? No. 
you come out at the point of the show where everybody's the hottest. MJF comes out every Saturday. He nuclear over, insane over. He tries to do some kind of uh, crowd surfing. I don't think Long Island understands what crowd surfing is. So that didn't go off well. But then he gets to the ring and, and he does his pose. His hair was a little weird. I don't know what's up with his hairstyle. It looks unkempt. What do you think, sir? Oh, I, dude, I... I'm like the last person to talk about hairstyles. There's a reason why I shave my head. No, it's just it's, fu- <laughs> it's just funny. It's uh, like you just like you know you look at the, the, the like professional haircuts and all that kind of stuff. They got this money, and it's just like his hair looked like it gotten away with him a little. It got a little away from him. Yes, yes, you are getting hair critiques from two bald men. Well, actually, one bald man. I'm the only one actually critiquing it. JR has abstained from this conversation. But you are getting a hair critique from a man that has no hair. None. Zero. It's gone. I tapped out, I think, like 15 years ago at this point. It's been a minute. All right. Let's go to the uh, end of the match. I thought this match was really good. I would have liked to see more of Hechicero. And MJF wrestling Hechicero style. Like, I would have liked to see, like, the grapple stuff on the a bottom. Just, to, you know, because that's what the show is. It's Forbidden Door. You're supposed to be seeing different styles, different performance from the com- a company. I thought he did it a little bit, but I would have liked, like, a little, like, three to five minute area in the middle where all they're doing is MJF showing that he can technical wrestle, too. Do you have any thoughts on my thought right there? No, I I agree with you. I um, I agree with you one hundred percent. Yes, and um, all right. So what we get? Has Cesaro blocked the Heat Seeker? Had Cesaro blasted MJF with the Mad Scientist bomb for a near fall? He did some di- damage to MJF's left arm. Uh, applied a cro- I started a little earlier than I should have on this. Applied a cross breaker, a cross arm breaker, but MJF escaped and went for the salt of the earth until Health Chisera rolled over and transitioned into a pin attempt. MJF kicked out at two. MJF spiked Health Chisera with a Long Island sunrise. <laughs> Followed up by a brain buster, brain buster, and pinned Health Chisera. MJF may be leaving with victory, but he's only leaving with a part of his arm, said Nigel. So MJF got the victory on this match. I will go first on thoughts. I mean, it kind of just went how I thought it was going to win. Like I said, a little more technical wrestling in the middle to show MJF's versatility, but instead it was just a good match. The crowd seemed to be into it because they were hot because it was the beginning of the show. Uh, there was a little middle, middle part where they may have gotten quiet, but for the most part they sound good. Uh, but it was a good match. What did you think, sir? I mean, this was MJF's first match back from injury, from being away. It's in his hometown. He's You, you need him, but the few that we're all waiting for is still some ways away due to injuries. So it's like, okay, we got to slowly bring him into this until we get to where we need to get to and give him a quality opponent on the Super Show and – to get him the W in his hometown, and he needed to go first because it's one of those ones where you know a New York crowd can be could be very. Um, I'm trying to think of the correct term, not hostile, but it can be unpredictable. As I'm looking for, so if you waited to like match fifth or six, and all of a sudden they go like, you know what, it's like you know ten ten thirty, and my boy MJF ain't here, all of a sudden, you you know, you may start getting boos and MJF chants until he finally comes out, so I think what they did the correct move by having him go on first in this in this show. All right. Now on to the next match. All-Star Trios match. We had the Elite, uh, which consists of, for this trio, the AEW Continental Champion, Kazuchika Okada, and AEW World Tag Team Champions, the Young Bucks. Uh, versus the Scissor Ace, Hiroshi Tamahashi, and the acclaimed Anthony Bowens and Max Caster. Now, just quick, how I thought this would go. I thought the acclaimed, which are they're trying to build as a threat to the Young Bucks, of course they were going to win this match. Uh, but no, the Elite, the Elite won this match. Uh... The, the, they um, what's it? Okay, the Bucks pumped up the Reeboks. They super kicked Okada and 
no, I feel like this is wrong. I feel like this summary is wrong. They super kicked Tanahashi and then took out the claim on the outside with dives over the ropes. Okada jumped off the ropes with the elbow to the ace. Okada went for the rainmaker, but the ace countered with a small package for a near fall. Okada smashed Tanahashi with a brutal drop kick, flowed, followed up with a rainmaker clothesline, and pinned Tanahashi. Vinny, uh, pa, uh, Okada was about to pick up Tanahashi and give him another rainmaker. Billy Gunn sprinted to the ring after the match to save Tanahashi from another rainmaker clothesline from Okada. Now, okay, okay, okay. Questions. The questions, like, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to go kayfabe for a minute. Sir, I think I asked you this question earlier. Why was you at the claim, the claimed, who has, like, Billy Gunn, the, like, tallest man on the universe, go get Tanahashi, who has literally done for, the like, the last five years constantly do nothing but lose to Okada? This is... <laughs> this is not one I can give an answer to as far as like being like you ain't know, kayfabe. It makes no sense, especially because I'm not saying this. This has been told to me is that Tanahashi has slowed down, you know, a lot in the last year or so um, as he's gotten older. So, yeah, I would have went with the guy who looks like a monster, you know, in that has you know in amazing shape but hey that's just me though hell i would have called jay white jay white's to beat okada why don't you call somebody that's actually pinned okada you know like in the last few years of course tanahashi beat okada in the past but you know it has moved on the kind of okada owns tanahashi now so what are we doing here i just like i say complete kayfabe inside of wrestling thinking wrestling logic that doesn't make any sense I personally thought the match was entertaining. I thought it was a good match. Um, I mean, in the end, with what happened later on the night, I do think the right team won because they are trying to establish the dominance of the elite. So I think this went along to, I think when the elite, these three have been the elite, they haven't lost. I don't think, I know Okada hasn't lost. And I don't think the Young Bucks have lost since staying in Derby. But them as a threesome hasn't lost at all. And then they were in the, you know, the match at uh, a match in Double or Nothing. They haven't lost. So right now, the lead is unbeatable. So I do think that was a good reason for the win. But as far as the match, it was a match. It, it, it existed. The ending was just, you know, kind of felt like it. I wouldn't say came out of nowhere because it's the Rainmaker. So there's some setup time. But it was just like a nothing finish. I thought like Max or Aunt Bowens were going to uh, jump in and kick out. But the match just ended. So now, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm a little bit shocked that the Elite won because I... I guess it's a typical wrestling trope, so which is I can understand maybe why they didn't do it. The they're supposed to be matched in the acclaim and the Young Bucks for the AEW World Tag Team Titles Championships. So one would venture to guess like, oh, you know, you get the acclaim to beat them again in this trios match, and it's like, hey, it's two non-title victories the acclaim has over the Young Bucks, and I'm assuming the assumption is after the Young Bucks who win a third one. Right now, it's kind of like, oh, you know, well, the acclaim lost some of the lost some of the shine they were getting, but you know, there's still a lot more time in the month of July, and let's see how it plays on TV. But I was a little bit shocked about the about the ending. I I thought the acclaim would have got the W. They went away. They went they went away, and it makes it, it it's like it's one of those times that you find out after the result that it does make sense both ways, but. Like I said, I kind of, you know, the claim, but I'm, I'm guessing they're trying to establish the dominance of the elite. All right. The next match was my most anticipated match of the night. Now, I have to say this. I was at my friend, Noel. We don't see each other much, and I haven't watched this match again. So I saw the beginning. I saw their end. There was about a five to ten minute part in the middle that I completely missed. So... This match could have been like the greatest match of all time, but I didn't see enough of it because I forgot our conversation just to let you peek you inside was him basically saying all the stuff he would fix about the AEW. And it was hilarious because all the stuff he would fix about the AEW would just make them like the WWE. 
and it was like he he wanted less matches. He wanted more time in between matches. He wanted time for each match to settle. He said uh, they were setting up MJF to beat Hechicero with the Brain Buster, and he's like, "Well, why did Kyle O'Reilly use a? I mean, Kyle Fletcher use a better Brain Buster early in the night? Maybe not both people should be using the Brain Buster." And I was like, "I'm like, okay, okay, okay." I was like. So I listened, I listened, and I, you know, and I was like, I took it into things. I was like, first of all, this is what makes AEW different. And each wrestler is an artist. That's how I've always saw it. And you kind of let them paint. So uh, I was like, the Kyle Fletcher Brain Buster and the MJF Brain Busters are two different Brain Busters because it's depending on who does it. Like, there is a DDT. Everybody, there's a DDT. Every wrestler has a DDT, right? But then there's Jake's DDT, right? Jake's DDT is a finisher. Everybody else's DDT, like the fake fist, fake punch, or fake super kick DDT that the Young Bucks use, is not a finisher. I don't think it's too complicated to be like, okay, when this guy does it, it's a finisher, and when this guy does it, it's not a finisher. So, JR, after I kind of told you what my friend thought, I know you do share his opinion on one of those things. What do you think about what he had to say? Um. Well, at the end of the day, you know, you want to be different because you have to set yourself apart to make yourself unique for people to tune in. As you, we talk about this all the time about like sports, for example, we love the NFL because they are the best at what they do. We don't want to see second, third tier football because it's not good. I don't want to see AEW do what WWE does. If AEW does what WWE does, I'll just watch WWE. But the one thing I will say, and this is just somebody watching at home, and there's, and again, when you watch at home, it's a different experience watching it live. But I, in my opinion, one man's opinion, I do think that there needs to be a few less matches and some breaks in between because a lot of I, for me personally, as we go through the show, we're watching at home. I feel like the matches start bleeding into each other, and it's just at the end of the night, I'm like. That was a great show, but I really kind of have a hard time remembering all the great things that happened to happened to it. A lot of times, I feel like I remember the beginning and I remember the end, but I miss all the middle. That's kind of uh, I know how <laughs> I, I felt about the the next match we're about to talk about. <laughs> so I'm like, that's I do. You know, I don't. I know other people have similar sentiments, and I know other people have the opposite, where they're just like, I want 15 matches and I want to just go, 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 but it's. You know, I think that's why in movies, like movies is another thing. You have your rising action, your falling action, your climax and all that stuff. It's about, you know, at the end of the day, yes, each match tells its own story, but those stories are part of a bigger story. And sometimes I think having some breaks in between just to be able to digest it, to enjoy it, I would say I feel is important. But again, that's one man's opinion. I actually felt it last night and especially during this match. And the reason I say that is we had a conversation we wanted to have, right? On WWE, using them as an example, I would have 20 minutes between each match to talk about the previous match and look forward to the next match, right? Mm -hmm. We would have had our whole conversation in that 20 minutes. And then I could have have concentrated on Brian Danielson versus Shingo Takagi. But... Because it went straight from one match to another, we were still having our conversation. We stopped at the beginning of the match and then kept having our conversation and missed the middle. So in this case, it was like, in this one case, this doesn't happen to me a lot. But in this one case, I was like, oh, I could see where a break could have helped. So, yeah, this is because, like I said, halfway through this match, for some reason, I don't know what happened. We just started talking about the thing we were talking about again and kind of ignored the match. <clears throat> no, I do know when it happened. And so because of that, I'm going to reach out uh, a little bit more. Shingo hit a shoulder tackle and then sent out uh, Santana Danielson. Danielson retaliated with a drop kick. Danielson went for a tope, but his feet got caught up in the ropes. Shingo grabbed Danielson and planted him on the draping net breaker on the arena floor. Doc Simpson checked in on Danielson's neck. Okay. This brings up a different point. Because I, I knew, I remembered exactly when it happened. 
So we did the Danielson stop in the middle of the match before or stop at the end of the match with uh, uh, Osprey. And because of that, you know, I kind of no sold this one. So we're waiting on Danielson to just get back in the ring and wrestle. And that's when the conversation started. And that's when we started missing the match. You know what I mean? I knew he wasn't really hurt. You know, like, like I said, when you do this too much, you know, you stop getting a reaction, right? So you did this in the middle of this match. I didn't react. We didn't go like, man, I hope he's okay. No, we just started talking about brain busters for some reason. What do you think about that thought? About talking about brain busters? No, talking about Danielson and the you know the selling the injury, having a doctor check on him. Do you think they're doing that too much? No, I mean it's part. I mean, it's part of his story. You know that he's as he's getting is getting into retirement, and he's you know a full time retirement, and he's um, you know slowing down. It, in some ways, let's think, I mean, they did the same thing last year with MJF. You know, starting with his, um, the I believe it was at All Out, I believe, last year when he was in the tag match against Dark Order. You know, it just it kind of persisted. It's one of those things where I think if I were to venture to guess, I think the end game may be him and Swerve at All In. But I think a lot of people are going to re- expect, want Brian Danielson to have that feel good moment and walk out as champion. And he said himself, he does not want to be a world champion, that he's at the end of his career and belongs to somebody else. So it's like, okay, well, how do you do that? This guy is going to run rough shot through the summer and he's going to burn. He's going to burn bright and he's going to burn fast, like, a, you know, like a firework. And he's going to get to all in and it's just like, it's nothing there. Very similar to, you know, in a way that he did with MJF and the Ironman match last year going into Revolution in San Francisco. <coughs> All right. Well, yeah. I, yeah. Hey, you know what? That is definitely, like I said, you, you disagree. But like I said, it just kind of worked that way because of how the match, how the what happened with the match. Uh, okay. So uh, at the end of the match, Danielson Clobber Shingo with the bicycle bi- knee. I don't know. Oh, yeah. But uh, Shingo kicked out. Uh, was that bad? Everything a- a- Danielson had left. Wondered Excalibur. Danielson captured uh, Shingo's wrist and stomped Shingo's head. Danielson wrenched back on Shingo's arm and Shingo gave the verbal tap. Shingo couldn't have moved an inch. That had to have been the verbal tap, said Nigel. So, uh, I thought the part of this match that I saw was really good. And it's like, I know I say this, but, you know, some people say this and they're not doing it. I'm going to watch that whole match again. And then when we do our show later in the week, if I have any additional thoughts, I will definitely add it. But I thought the match was really good for what I saw. But this is me just being open and honest as a fan. I didn't see it all. So, JR, maybe you have more in-depth thoughts on what you thought of the match or maybe you don't. No, I, I it, for me, it's everything I thought it was. You're two of the best wrestlers in the world today. You know, representing their 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 respective promotions. It's hard though when you have two guys that you know is going to bring it, and you know it's going to be a great match. Sometimes, you know, you have these expectations that are like high, and even when they hit it, you're like, yeah, that happened. Cool, I expected it, but it's just because we. I feel like we do it to ourselves all the time. Like, I remember, you know, thinking about matches with Omega and remember thinking about matches with the Bucks, matches with FTR. It's kind of like, yeah, of course it's going to be great. Look who's in the ring. So you set those expectations so high. It's like, yeah, even when they hit it and you're like, well, they, you expected it to be a 10 and it's a 10, but you don't have the same feeling as like, well, like if a match, you know, you thought it was going to be a three and it ends up being a seven. You're like, oh my God, that match was amazing. So it's like, yeah, I don't have anything like, I'm jumping for joy because it's like, yeah, I set myself up for like they're going to put on a banger match, and that's what they did. They put on a heck of a match. They're great wrestlers, and, and I enjoyed it. And, and, you know, I hope this is not the last of this, of these two being in the ring together. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, AEW's Women's World Champions match. 
the timeless one, Tony Storm, versus Mina Shirakawa with uh, Mariah May. Uh, Luther's, uh, 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 oh, Mariah May was in both of their corners, and then Luther was also in Timeless Tony, because she literally came out with Timeless Tony and then went in back and came back with Mariah May, right? Yes. Okay, so that was uh, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, um, Mina Shirakawa, I, I mean, I don't know like her signed situation, what her contract situation is. But if she's not a permanent member of the AEW roster when possible, I will be shocked. She has, to me, this is before talking about the match, she is taken to American television, like, amazingly, you know. And even though she doesn't speak English, what she says matters. And she does a lot with her expressions and her dance to let you know what she's thinking. I I, I have loved every minute of her on our TV. Uh, have you have any thoughts on her being in the AEW so far, sir? I I don't know of a talent in the AEW's women's division that has come in and it, let's I mean put aside Taraya, put aside Mercedes Monet, but it's just like somebody that probably American audience is not familiar with, and the how over she got as as she did, she just gets it. And as a, when you talk about it, as somebody who's an international talent coming in, that's a hard thing to do. I mean, there's a lot of talent who's come to any company from Mexico, from Japan, from the from Europe, and it's just Australia. It's just kind of like, how do they get into the American audience and how do they fit in? And she just has it. She has a natural charisma about her that I think people, you know, love and, and want to see. Yeah, and, and it's just been like, it's just been like nuclear. It was like, dude, to the point where I was like making the argument, maybe you put the title on Mina. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't talking about a long title run. I was talking about give it back to Tony in a few weeks. But dude, she has just been that good, you know, that, you know, like people love her. And I don't think they would have hated Mina winning this match. All right. Uh, all right. Mina stunned Tony with a roundhouse kick. Tony fired back with two consecutive head bumps and then stuffed Mina with uh, the Storm Zero scoring the pin. Mina, they they gave you a lot in this match as far as thinking, you know, tried to make you think Mina was going to lose. There was like one move, I don't remember where it was, where it was like, yeah, oh yeah, here, Mina drilled Tony with a diving Denny, diving T off the top rope for a near fall. I wasn't sure Tony Storm kicked out before three. Like, it was, Tony Storm played it that close. It was like a split second, and they got me. They got me on that one. Uh, but the Storm Zero, uh, Marie, Mariah, does, after the win, Mariah doesn't know if she should cheer or not. She still torn, but what a battle. M Mina really put the champion to the test here, which she did. And just think about that. So I, I like it, I have this point to make later about uh, w women's wrestling. And just I think this was that Tony did a lot to make Mina look good in this match. Tony helped Mina to her feet. Mina extended her hand for Tony to shake it. Tony accepted. Mariah encouraged them to hug. They did. And then the three of them in... The Thirsty Man Olympics. This was the Thirsty Man gold medal. The Thirsty Man everything. The three of them shared a kiss on the match. And Nigel, who represents the horny teenager that lives inside of all of us, stands up and applauds and starts to cry. I mean, Nigel McGinnis, a, a color commentator, announcer of the year, right here for that reaction because... I ain't going to say he was every man, but he was a lot of the men watching that match with his reaction. I just thought that was so cool. Uh, yes, I am putting over the color commentator's reaction through three women kissing. I am doing that right now because Nigel was all of us. I imagine a lot of women too, but I cannot speak for women. I've learned better than that. Eight sisters and a wife. I speak for myself. Not for women. I don't know how y'all felt about it, but I, few, I think a few were down with what happened. But Nigel was all of us. Sir, what did you think of the match? What did you think of what happened after the match? The match, as well, I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, 
I would like to see before I formulate like a strong opinion on talent, I want to see a lot of their work. I've only been familiar with Mina's work um, a few times. I actually got a chance to see her in stardom when I was in Japan. Uh, she wrestled in a tag match uh, against Donna Del Mondo. And then I've seen her a few times in AEW. So I think it's one of those ones where I didn't have really like expectations. And I think the match, you know, like I said earlier, it's like it could have been, I, I don't want to put a number on it, but it's just like I just popped more because it's like I just didn't have expectations compared to the previous match we talked about with Shingo and Brian. As far as, I don't have any comments about the afterwards. It is what it is. It was a very interesting storyline they told with, with everybody. Okay. All right. <coughs> yeah, this is like, it was three women kissing. Three very, 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 very attractive women kissing. Very, 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 very attractive. I don't know if I got over it that they're all attractive. I don't know if that worked. All right, next match we got. Mr. Zack Sabre Jr. versus Freshly Squeamish Orange Cassidy. Thing that I've had to wrap my head around for the last couple of weeks. Speaking of Zack Sabre Jr., I once Googled him. Just to, uh, I was trying to see what the name of a move was, and I found out his real name isn't Zack Sabre Jr. I I need to know that I like there is probably a podcast, uh, there is probably an interview out there. I need to know how he picked that name. Because he's junior. Is there a Zack Sabre? Is there like a famous UK wrestler named Zack Sabre? I was like, dude, it just like broke my heart that his real name wasn't Zack Sabre Jr. Because I thought that was just such a cool name. And I thought that was his name. And then he was going against freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy. Fun fact about me, because I'm a diabetic, I don't drink orange juice. Like at all. So, yeah. It spikes your blood sugar. You can look it up. It's kind of funny. All right. Sabre. uh, Let's go to the end. Uh, Saber escaped the mousetrap from Orange. So this uh, chain at the end where Saber was trying to get him in his roll-up and then uh, his uh, clutch and then Orange Cassidy's trying to hit him with the same move and how they got to the submission to tap him out was like quintessential 100%. If I had to take a section of of wrestling and say that is Zack Zach Sabre Jr. It was the end of this match. That is Zack Sabre Jr. The unique thing about him is he has finishing moves, quote unquote, but a lot of times he ends up tapping you out with some random submission. And that is why he's like the wrestler that you cannot look away from when he's on screen. Because his match, unlike any other wrestler, can literally end at any time. I thought this match was great. I thought Orange Cassidy showed me something. And Zack Sabre Jr. making Orange Cassidy one of the biggest stars in AEW, one of the protected stars in AEW, actually verbally tap was a big scout for Zack Sabre Jr. Big things. What other company are letting you come in and tap out one of their biggest stars? I thought that was pretty cool. What did you think, JR? Well, you know, the one thing that people will criticize the show that you know because i've seen criticisms that you know all oh, aw goes over new japan does it well this is one where it's like hey he's he is a very prominent popular aw guy and zach saber jr is somebody we talked about this in, in the preview show is somebody that new japan may be looking at to get over as a main eventer so on this show that you have the super show it makes a lot of sense for Zack Sabre to go over because that's to get one back. I think New Japan, in my opinion, has done a lot of favors for AEW in their joint work together with getting AEW talent over New Japan talent. So this is one where I think, you know, I do feel that New Japan was due one back. And, you know, when you bring out, you, I think based on my opinion, like the top five single stars in AEW, Orange Cassidy is in that top five because of his popularity with the AEW crowd. Oh yeah, he was he was definitely been an MVP of AEW. He's his uh, progression to the ice, uh, the international title, all the things that he do, the people that he's had to beat has been some of the best storytelling in AEW. So yeah, Zack Saber Jr. beating him, amazing, awesome, great match. Another trios match is coming up. We have the Learning Tree, uh, Chris Jericho. With the Redwood Big Bill, uh, with Bad Apple Brian Keith, 
And they are tagging with the New Japan World Television Champion, Jeff Cobb. And they were wrestling. This group needs a name. You should work a chop some names. If you have ideas for interesting names, go ahead and send them to the uh, at ATLE pot. Tag us in it. Uh, send us a direct message. Uh, you know, send me a direct message. Do not email in. I don't check the email. I'm just it's just real. I don't take it. So if you've emailed me, I am sorry. I don't check it. I have a hard enough time keeping up with my personal email. So DM us on Twitter if you have any interesting names for this group. Uh, we got Hook, Samoa Joe, and the wrestler Shibata. Like, if the group was called the Wrestlers, I would be bad at it, but they need, like, like a hard name. Like, you know, they just need something that's just really gangster. You know what I mean? Because, dude, they're, it's, like, to me, they have more mafia feel than the uh, family in uh, NXT because they did the things where they were like walking up, having casual conversations and then beating the shit out of people that felt like it was straight out of a mafia movie. So I think they need a really cool name. I don't want it to be mafia inspired because you know, they're not, but it would be cool. All right. So how this match ended? Um, yes. So hook hit the double sledge, uh, hammer to big bill on the outside of the ring. I thought that was cool. Got him a little macho man going in there. Uh, Jericho hit Shibata with a low blow as Brian Keith distracted the referee. Jericho put Shibata in the walls and Shibata kicked his way out of the hold. Hook avoided a splash from Cobb and then T-boned Cobb. Jericho rocked Hook with a code breaker for a near fall. Hook sent Jericho for a ride with the T-bone suplex. Hook nailed Jericho with the Judas effect. With there was a, like a, it's so funny because he did the elbow and then in the middle of it there was a little pause. And they're like, boom, like, I want you to see this coming. And, like, he could have just not done it well. But to me, in my whole brain canon, it was him pausing to, like, he really wanted Jericho to see that he was hitting him with his move. And he pinned Jericho with the Judas effect. Taz jumps up, celebrates it. He beat Homeboy with his own move. Hook, Samoa Joe, and the wrestler get the pin, get the victory, I this is a trio that's going to future. I see trios tag team champions with them. I think they have done a good job. I felt like a lot of people were off the hook bandwagon, and I think they've done a good job rehabilitating Hook. I thought this match was fun. I love Big Bill in this character. I love Ryan Keith in this character. Now I do have one quick kayfabe question for after you tell us what you think about the match. I think this is the third time Jericho has brought in Jeff Cobb. And Jeff Cobb loses every time. Why would you keep bringing in Jeff Cobb? But talk about the match and then talk about my point because there's probably not a good answer to that one. You with me, sir? Or do you still got me on mute? I apologize, uh, guys. I put myself on mute because yeah. sometimes I hear noises. My dog barks. Yeah, there, like, yeah, there was no out. sound, no oh, air oh, coming geez. through. And there was no sound, uh, no air coming what through. I so said, what I said to nobody was, this match would have been great on Collision. I it's, I just did not need this match. It. I'm not a fan of Jericho's work. I I know some. I know a number of individuals who watch AW Weekly that are just over Jericho and his and his gimmicks, and it's just it just has not worked in a while for many of us. I think it's just a bathroom break for me at this point. And I, I love Samoa Joe. I think hook is a heck of a, you know, a heck of a rising star from the first time I saw him make his debut. And I just saw his athletic ability. I thought this guy was the future of AEW Shibata. I remember the first time I saw him to the day he wrestled side of the show at a ring of honor show. And I was like, this guy is everything people talk about. I just don't like this at all. I just think it's just a waste of AEW. It's bad to me. And I hate saying this because I know somebody else uses it, but other people use it. I can't think of anything better. It's just to me, it's bad WWE story, you know, gimmicks, and that's why I don't like it with an AEW. Um, the after the after part where you said Jericho, yeah, I Jericho is a brain dead moron, so that's why he keeps getting Jeff Cobb, and Jeff Cobb keeps losing, <laughs> which makes no sense because honestly, Je- Jeff Cobb. I mean, for me, I'd rather see Jeff Cobb versus Samoa Joe. At, forbid, at, at Forbidden Door because those two are two of the biggest hosses in, in, in all professional wrestling. 
Yeah, there was this more point where they were uh, fighting, and they they started doing the meat thing, and they were like meat, meat, meat. And I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, Samoa Joe does not like the meat thing. Like I've seen this twice happen, where he was in the ring and people were about to do the meat thing, and then he just like does something else to stop it. He is not into the meat at all. He is not just into the, the two big guys just hammering each other, New Japan, uh, never open weight style. No, he he just stops it. He doesn't do meat. Have you noticed that about him? He is not into the meat. I, I have not. I I've not seen it, but I'm not. But I believe you if you say it happened. I mean, I don't want to venture to guess why he has an issue with it. Yeah, like I mean, it's. I mean, his ability. I mean, I, I mean, maybe it's a trope, whatever. But yeah, every time they do the meat thing, he's the one that stops it, and it's usually very e- e- early in the meat chant. So you know, we want that 15 minutes of just big meaty men beating the shit out of each other, or at least give us a two minute thing. And he's like, Nah, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go off the ropes and hit a super kick or some shit like that. I don't know. I just like, I, I, I would like to ask, Joe, why do you hate meat? Is, is Joe a vegan? Is Joe a vegan? No, I, mean, a- I think I think what it is is part of the, it, what it could be, if I would venture to guess this one, is that the whole meat thing is for typically, because it started with Big E. Big E doing that something during a podcast with, with the New Day. He says, I don't care about your five-star matches. I don't care about... You know, the athletic ability. I just want to see two big, big meaty men like me. Well, Samoa Joe, for how, you know, as the size that he is, has never been a guy who's not, who's he's never been a talent that's not known for his wrestling ability. He got over because he's a hell of a wrestler. And so I think when he, you know, in that situation, is like, hey, I'm not just a big, you know, you know, brain dead monster that just slaps people around i can i can wrestle i can do submissions i can do technical stuff i can do whatever i want because that's who i am so that's why i would say benji why you may have an issue with the whole meat thing yeah well sir give us meat i literally just want jeff cobb i want a match for jeff cobb and samojo like sit there and just swap forearms for 10 to 15 minutes, and then one guy hits each, the other one with a finisher. That's all I want. But, yes, this was a good match in the middle. And let's see. We're going on to TNT ladder match. Top flights, Dante Martin. Now, this is the bathroom break right here. I will tell anybody, if you watch AEW, this is a friendly from your friend, from your good friend Floyd. When there is a match with six individuals in it, ign- uh, forget the, uh, uh, forget the, uh, you know, the watching the entrances and go to the bathroom. Because you know each you got six six entrances, each entrance of what lasts two minutes. That's a twelve minute bathroom break. Boom. That's when I. This is when I went to the bathroom, and just came back in the ring. So that is a friendly. Tip from your good pal Floyd for listening to the show. This is what else you get when you listen to All Things Elite. Even tips on when to go to the bathroom. This is when you go to the bathroom. Entrances. Entrances. All right. So, all right. A lot of shit happened in this match. A lot of crazy shit. Mark Br- Mark Briscoe uh, had one of the moments of the night, and I won't call it it was a mistimed area. I don't like using the word botch because I don't know. I have never wrestled, so I don't know what's a botch and what's a part of the storyline. But he jumps off the top of the ladder to put a, a jungle boy through a table or ladder. They would think it was through a table. And he basically jumped short and kind of missed. And on Twitter, which again, if you did not read this, and uh, uh, Mark Briscoe's voice, uh, I don't, I don't know what you're doing in life, but he said the word for the day. Uh, hold on a second, damn it, I had this up. His name is weird on the line, so it's like Sussex Chicken something or something. Sussex Chicken Company, uh, company, yeah. <laughs> so whatever. 
He said the phrase of the day is trajectorial miscalculation. Jack Perry, you sucky lucky son of a bitch. This six inch ladder hop, uh, ladder uh, six inch ladder hop is the only reason I didn't squash you like a bug and win the TNT title. Uh, like the old saying goes, the sun shines on the dog's ass every now and then. I'll see you when I see you, son. Love it. God, he took something that a lot of people would consider a botch, turned it a part of storyline, acknowledged it, loved it. All right. At the end, we get T- Kester climbing the ladder. Briscoe stops him in his tracks with a share top t- chair shot to the back. Mark Briscoe blasts it to Kester with a J driller onto the ladder in the corner. Yeah, he's done. Briscoe climbed towards the title, but Jack Perry hit Briscoe in the ribs with another ladder. Jack Perry bludgeoned Briscoe with a steel chair, climbed up to the TNT title, and pulled it down. The winner of your match and new TNT champion, the no longer broken pillar. I am taking this moniker away from him. He is no longer the broken pillar, the scapegoat Jack Perry. Excalibur said... The Elite tried to give Perry the TNT title, but I hate to say it, he earned it tonight. I thought this match was a banger. It was a bunch of athletic people doing athletic shit. Takeshita should have won. Takeshita should win every match. Takeshita should go on a seven-year non-losing streak. I am a Takeshita guy. So anytime Takeshita loses, I don't like it. I will be, every week on the show, I will be talking about Takeshita in the G1 because I just like Takeshita that much. I have become an ultimate fanboy for that guy, and I just thought he was amazing in this match. But I thought everybody was good. Leo Rush, dude, every time I see him, exceptional. That dude, there is no Leo Rush comp. I I want to say that. There's no Leo Rush. No one moves as fluid and as effortlessly as he does. Dude, he's so good. I'm like, dude, if he was six foot, they'd be talking about him with Ricochet and Will Ospreay. It's just... That simple. The dude is on an athletic another level. I really thought this match was great. Uh, the elevation of Jack Perry from what he was at all in to what he is now should be studied and copied. Um, what did you think, Jr.? Uh, I'll be honest. It's, it's a, to me, it was a typical AW ladder match. It was predictable. I didn't want Jack Perry to win. I think Takeshi should have won. I don't think all guys in the elite need to have the championships. I've mentioned that at the preview. Uh, I do want to say shout out to CM Punk because he did in 24 hours what AW couldn't do in the previous years of existence, and that's get Jack Perry over. So congratulations, CM Punk, making another talent. Yeah, I mean, CM Punk, as much as I don't want to admit it or anyone wants to admit it, is a large pre-reason that Jack Perry is over right now. A large reason. It's not as much love for Jack Perry as much as it is hate for CM Punk, but his performances and promos have reached other level. A, he has definitely elevated himself. His physique is a lot better. I mean, everything about him, he fixed. Not just, uh, you know, not just, um, uh, not just like it just didn't happen because of Punk. There is a lot about his presentation and his promos. That has improved. It's like it's 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 everything. It's not just one thing. So I, w- I definitely want to give a shout out because you know he's did the, he's done the work and improved everything to be where he was. I still can't wait for FTR to give him the old shadow machine. But uh, until then, I'm really enjoying everything he does. I'm probably higher on I'm higher on him than probably a lot of people because I was so low on him. I was like, dude, maybe he should go to NXT. Maybe he should go away. You know, I was there at level. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really happy nah, for him. I, I, I'm going to go back. He, he wouldn't have nothing without CM Punk, including his promos or whatever, because I dare anybody to tell me that that person had anything going for him and did, with his, going into his feud with Hook into All In. Nobody cared about that, man. That's why he was on the opening pre-show of All In with against Hook is all about what happened after the fact and people hating CM Punk that got this dude what he where he's at today. And you know what? Congrats on him for taking something that was a bad situation to turn into a positive for him. But at the end of the day, they tried since 2019 to get that man over as a babyface, and they tried last year to get him over as a heel, and it was not working until what happened with CM Punk. 
And if anybody, if somebody says differently, they're they're denying facts. Yeah, I don't think anyone's saying differently. <laughs> not between you and I. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm not saying any differently. I thought it was so funny how much we were burying the uh, showing of the CM Punk. Uh, it, how embarrassing, uh, you know, like, oh, they showed the CM Punk video. That didn't work, and it has worked. It was the right, it was the right decision, the right idea. Everything has worked since then. It's so crazy to me. Because, well, again, shit, I was down on it. Don't get me wrong. It ain't like, I don't know, proclivity of positivity. I was like, man, I wouldn't have done that. But it has worked in every way. Just a home run all the way around. The initial reaction wasn't good, but everything in there has been executed perfectly. Next match up. Title for title. TBS champion. Ti- the uh, CEO, Mercedes Monet. Versus New Japan Strong Women's World Champion Stephanie Vakor. And I got to say this before I talk about any other thing in the match. If I had to give an MVP on the night of Forbidden Door, Stephanie Vakor. Uh, I've seen, uh, I've listened to other podcasts and everybody's like, Stephanie Vakor like outperformed uh, Mercedes Monet. And... Let me. I want to let that sink in, right? Let 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 that sink in. I have a different take, and I will share it after this match. But I thought this match was really good. I felt like if Stephanie Ricor was in AEW, literally they would have made a star in this match because I thought she was so good. She did some kind of like like jumping on the ropes into an arm drag move. I was just like, man, it looks so fluid. Like I've seen that move before. It wasn't nothing I'd never seen before, but it was so fluid. And then there was this move with her legs where she got Mercedes into a submission. And I was like, good Lord, I've never seen that transition like that. And yeah, Stephanie took it to her. Uh, Stephanie took it to her. And I just, I was, I came out of this match like a lot of people, very, surprised i mean very like almost like a stephanie vacor fan because i'd seen her twice and i thought she was all right but this match like blew it away uh mercedes nailed vacor with two consecutive backstab mercedes jumped off the top rope but vacare blocked her and then countered her with a dragon school screw which was like one of the nastiest dragon screws i've ever seen vacare charged at mercedes and landed a knee strike for a near fall Mercedes locked in the crossface again, but Vakir escaped. Mercedes managed to find the Monet maker, applied the crossface submission, and forced Vakir to tap out. The CEO, Mercedes Monet, is now TBS champion and the new New Japan Strong. Yeah, that's kind of weird. New New Japan. New NJPW Strong Women's Champion. She strays in her way right up to Boston with two titles, says Taz. All right, before we get to what happened after the match, sir, what did you think of the performance of Stephanie Wakor and Mercedes Monet? Um, you know, I really wish in this situation I'm more familiar with Stephanie's work um, because when you hear that, you know, she stole the night. I'm not saying she did it. She outperformed Mercedes. That's the one where it's like, it's not that I have a problem with it. It's one of those ones where, and I'll give you an example. If... If you know the body of work of somebody when they're going into a match, I can say, like, yes, she performed her because I know what she's capable of. But not being familiar with somebody's work, I can't say one way or another, like, yeah, they outperformed them because at the end of the day, as you and I talk about, it takes two to tango. Like, you could have a, you could be a great partner, but if you're, if the other person isn't good, you're not going to tell a good story. You're going to have a bad dance routine. So it's that, and we know what Mercedes is capable of. I'm not, I'm not saying that to diminish what what Stephanie did over the weekend. Um, and the match she had is just one of the ones where I'm going to, to be as impartial as possible. I think (laughs) both women, both women, women brought it in their match for title for title, which is, that's what we wanted in this, um, in a forbidden door, you bring your best A game to Long Island and to Arena, 
and you put on the performance of a lifetime in this situation. And I think both women did that. Stephanie record was amazing tonight, but uh, I will use this like, and like I might go on for a second here because there's a lot of examples. When you bring in a star like Mercedes Monet, she's already a star. She's already worldwide known. She's multiple time WWE champion, main event at a WrestleMania night. Um, you know, you know, she's a star on Star Wars. She's a star by every every uh, measure of the word star. But when you bring those people in, of course, you want them to bring in attendance, merchandise, all that stuff. But you want to use them to make other stars. Mercedes Monet has had three matches, two at pay-per-views, one against Willow and one against Stephanie Vercoeur. After the Willow match, everybody was coming out about how fucking awesome Willow was. After the Stephanie Vercoeur match against Mercedes Monet, they were coming out how fucking awesome Stephanie Vercoeur was. Isn't that isn't that Mercedes Monet's job? Like, we found out that this week she has creative control. She's in a match with Stephanie Record. Look at that match. That match was like 70-30 Stephanie. Mercedes gave her so much to make sure she looked strong in that match and the crowd can get behind her. Of course, I didn't even know this. I didn't even think about it. Apparently, there was a New York-Boston thing because she represents Boston real hard. Halfway through the crowd, the New York fans just starts going, Stephanie, Stephanie. But it doesn't, like, that doesn't matter. She was great, and the fans got behind her. 80% of the fans probably didn't know who she was before the match, but by the end of the match, they're standing her name. As much credit as I want to give to Stephanie, I want to give the exact same amount of credit to Mercedes Monet. So what I'm saying here is I am not taking anything away from Stephanie. I am also giving Mercedes Monet credit and the flowers too, because we all know wrestling, this beautiful thing is a dance. And you literally, you, most people can't dance by themselves. And you look at the two matches she had comes in, both of the people came out like, oh, more over than they were before. So she's the common denominator. What do you think about that, JR? No, I, I mean, absolutely. And you are right is that, um, and I'll give you, and I'll say this, uh, I'll give you another analogy. You know, because we talked about this off the air, people talk about how great Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels is because of what they could do with their opponents of all different shapes, sizes, athletic abilities, and wrestling styles. Uh, I think I believe Kevin Nash is when I says it. He, you know, obviously, means he's not a great wrestler, but what makes what made Bret and Shawn great is they could work around his limitations. And that's and I'm not saying and I'm not saying that Stephanie or Willow is limited, but it's that as a great wrestler, you are being able to adapt to your opponent and and you can accentuate what the what they bring to the table. The other thing I, I actually do want to mention this because I know she's been getting a lot of flack about this whole concept of creative control. You know, nobody knows what that means at the end of the day. They're not Tony Khan. They're not Mercedes. They're not on the booking committee. What they're doing is they're taking a phrase that has been tossed around for the last 20 plus years since the demise of WCW that was used for certain talents. That was used, you know, Bret Hart talked about in his last 30 days. He had a creative control in WWF before he left to go to WCW in 1997. So people are like, well, of course, you know, Mercedes positioned herself to get to, you know, become a double champion in, her, in you know in, within her first three matches but i'll say this can we just wait to see what the end result is if it's a year and she's still undefeated and she has you know both belts and and is looking to get a third one okay then we can talk about this maybe a little bit more but it's just like for somebody who's only three matches into her aw career let's just see where it goes like maybe you know you're gonna she's already a star the biggest woman star that they've ever signed from her previous work in previous companies, New Japan and WWE. And then, you know, maybe her goal is like, I see that person. I see that woman. And if I continue to build myself up, 
when it's time for me to do the job, it's going to make that person, that woman, an even bigger star because they're taking away somebody who's at the height of their career with AEW. That's all I'm saying. Completely agree. I would completely agree. Again, I am a big person on the monster push. I am the big person on someone losing a lot. And once you're, you know, once you get to that point and then you put the other person over, it means more. I mean, honestly, look at Cody and Roman Reigns right now. Look at Gunther and Sami Zayn. It means more after a long title reign than when someone loses. And it's just like sometimes you got to eat it. And of course, you know, Unfortunately, fans know way too much about wrestling, about contracts and stuff like that. And, then, you know, people are open about it. So people think they can chime in on shit they don't know about, you know, that they don't actually understand. You know, I've done it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm above it. I chime in on shit I don't know about all the time. So uh, it's just but in it because it becomes this and people try to use the backstage politics and stuff that they assume they know to try to take away from someone's ability. I thought Mercedes Monet was just as good as Stephanie McCurr because you need two people to make someone look good. It's that simple. It's why I've been an FTR fan for so long. And people were like, well, FTR was only good because they were in the match with American Alpha and DIY and blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, yeah, but what was the common denominator in that match? FTR. They don't look good if FTR doesn't help them look good that's just that's just how wrestling works so i don't know again like i said went on too long about this already but i just thought they were both great i'm saying both of these women were great i am not taking anything away from stephanie wicker pretty much when i know she has a match i will be watching going forward that's how much she got over with me in that match and of course mercedes monet i mean she's on my favorite tv show so never gonna not watch it all right I got to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this. Probably the most disappointing match of the night to me. IWGP World Heavyweight Championship match. John Moxley versus Ted Nsuya Naito. Uh, I don't know if timing was off, communication was off, but this match looked clunky as F. It wasn't a bad match. I'm not calling it a bad match, but damn, they, they weren't on the same page. And, you know, it ended... Moxley drilled Naito with the Death Rider, but not uh, Death uh, Naito kicked out. Moxley left the ring and grabbed a steel chair, which they have been building. That he's been losing patience. The ref moved the chair from the ring. Moxley's frustrations were starting to boil over. Naito uh, nailed Mox with back elbows and then planted Moxley head first. Not, uh, Ma- Naito followed up with the Destino and pinned Moxley. We got a new champ. History was made tonight, Jim, uh, gentlemen. Jim Ross was on the call. So, there was this move where I think John Moxley was supposed to be doing a DDT and Naito was supposed to reverse it into a, a, a reverse. He was going for the Death Rider and Naito was supposed to reverse it into uh, Destino. It's one of those things that probably looked better on paper and in their head than the execution because it kind of just looked like Naito took a move and then just got up before Moxley and then hit his finisher. It was weird. It was clunky. This match w- was... Uh, yeah, this was a match I expected to be great, and it was I. Right. What do you think, Jr.? It was a match that happened. Uh, I I will say now that this whole this whole storyline is basically come to an end. Naito got the belt back after losing to Moxley in Chicago. It, it was a thing that happened. And that's one of the things I don't like about wrestling sometimes is that we do things because sometimes companies will do things just for a, like a pop or just to get like a ticket sell up. But in the grand scheme, it's like it just wasn't this to me just wasn't a memorable thing. Maybe maybe for somebody in Japan, maybe for those people in Chicago, maybe maybe it did. But for me, it's, it didn't do anything. I just. When he lost it, it was like, oh, of course he's going to get it back. I thought it should have been in Japan, but that's just me, though. That shit. I knew when, before the match show started, I said, Moxley's going to win it. 
And, and you, I mean, the person that hears me more than anyone in the world, I said, Moxley's going to win it in Chicago and lose it at Forbidden Door. Did I not say that? You are 100% correct. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I knew exactly, like, it just seemed so obvious to me. And I was supposed to be in Chicago, but, you know, work. You know, real life got in a fucking way of wrestling. Um, I was supposed to be in Chicago. Didn't happen. But, uh, yeah, it was just, it was literally one of those things where, um, one of those things where it just was very obvious. And I was just hoping we got a banger match. And Mox, to me, is better in matches where he's putting people over than he in matches where he's going over. So he's better in matches that he loses. Like the person generally has to go through hell to beat him. And I've always been entertained in his losing matches, which is it's weird to say that. But he's really good at making someone look like they put him through hell to beat him. And in this match, because of that ending, it just looked like, oh, my God. It looked like, hey, he was supposed to win and he won, which is never how you want to feel when you're watching wrestling. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I mean, it's... it's- the only thing worse is is seeing um, in they do this in boxing where you get a guy who's like, "Hey, we need to make a match," um, and they put up against you know the, the the proverbial tomato can or it's a tuna match. It's kind of like I know that guy's gonna win. Why are we doing this? Yeah, I don't know. As somebody, I guess somebody that grew up on storyline based wrestling, you know, maybe it's, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's for somebody else. Yeah. So, uh, last but not least, we had the main event, AEW World Championship match. The world champions, Swerve Strickland versus the AEW International Champion, Will Ospreay. Ospreay's entrance was like, it, it was for a specific audience, a specific audience. It was it was him showing him doing moves and Hayabusha doing moves. And if you're a New Japan fan or, you know, a hardcore wrestling fan, you know exactly who this person is. I like my friend Noel was like, I have no idea what's going on here. Who is that guy? And then Will Ospreay came out dressed as him and dressed as him. And then like. I guess he wasn't paying attention. And then we got to like part of the match and he was like, is Will Ospreay doing a pirate gimmick now? I was like, no, he's <laughs> dressed like Hayabusha. They did the little video package before. See, video packages uh, are great. If you you're watching them. Realized? Yeah. <laughs> what? We got to talk about, we, we got to talk about one. Uh, I'm sorry. We got to talk about one thing after we do Swerve. We, we missed one thing on this show, but we got, what, what did we miss? Swerve. What did we miss? I don't, I, I, I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. Let's finish the main event. Okay, because it might have been what I was going to bring up in the news and notes, but we'll see. Probably it, it's it, probably yeah, because yeah, because uh, I was thinking if I'm thinking what you're thinking, if we're on the same page, it's what I was going to bring up in the news and notes. Uh, all yeah. right, so this match, like that entrance was great. Hayabushi World Championship match. I was like, oh, he's dedicating the match to his grandma. Like, I was a hundred percent sure Swerve was winning this match. He came out in the Hayabusha gear, and if I'm saying his name right, if I'm not, whatever. Uh, I will do better next time. And then he's like, oh, his grandma died, and they're dedicating the match to him. I was like, it's Will Ospreay about to win this match. I went down to like 78%. That's, that's scientific right there. I went from 100% to 78%. I was like, man, they're sitting up there. Will Ospreay to win. He's, he's dedicating this match to his dead grandma. He got to win. Then Swerve came out, and well, not even Swerve, out comes Jim Jones, and you know, I guess New Yorkers know who he is, and, but if you're a younger person living, he did this song called We Fly High, you know it, Bowling. Yeah, he did that before the match, so you would know who he was, you know. And Jim Jones, multi-platinum recording artist Jim Jones, came out, and he said, and his guy Swerve Strickland, I'm like, Swerve has done a lot of things to look like a champion, but bringing out Jim Jones in New York was pretty, that was pretty strong pull right there. And Swerve comes out, Jim Jones comes out with him. And, you know, Swerve, when I drive, he even did the dance. He knew it. Big pressure. I apply. Yeah. It was like everybody was grooving. It was a good time. 
Uh, apparently, Jim Jones had some kind of snafu getting over the guardrail. Uh, you can find that video on Twitter. It's pretty funny. And But then the match happened. And all I have to say before I talk about how it ended, Will Ospreay is the best in-ring performer of our generation. If you do not agree with that, we just... There, I mean, we just don't watch wrestling the same way. Like every match, every if you, when you look at his opponents and you talk about the best match of their life, their best match of their career, it was probably against Will Ospreay. Like this match was amazing. I I went five stars or above on this match. It was amazing. It was probably his third best match this year. That's how good this man is. Swerve Strickling, amazing. Probably my favorite wrestler in AEW right now. Uh, so don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from Swerve Strickland. Me, me gassing up, talking about how good Will Ospreay is, has nothing to do with how I feel about Swerve Strickland. Like Swerve Strickland and Kesha, like one and one A for me. Those are my guys in AEW. But fuck Will Ospreay is really, 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 really fucking good. God, there was this opening, opening, uh, opening like, um, what is it? Uh, what word am I looking for? Uh, God damn it. My brain's not broken right now. But they went through this uh, series of moves. Yeah, series of moves where they were. Flipping out of each other's moves, blocking each other's moves. Like, dude, we study each other. We've wrestled before. We know who the fuck you are. We know what was coming. And it was just like, dude, I've seen it like on the indies and, and it looks more like a dance. They did this so well. It looked like they were trying to kill each other. And I just was like, I want more of this in wrestling. Not just from like AEW, WWE. I want it all around. It was just like you go in there and people go in there and they do their own routines. And I just want people to like break it up and be like, dude, no, I know what's coming. And it was just so well done. Uh, dude, and I could go through like every spot in this match and talk about how awesome it is. But, but it would it would take literally it would take us an hour to an uh, hour to go over this match. Oh, shit. I did forget something. I forgot. We forgot on the Mercedes thing, but we'll come back. Swerve, okay, so let's get to the end. Swerve transitioned quickly, stepping down on Will's arm with his boot. Swerve hit the house call again, right on Osprey's temple. Uh, no, no, no. You need to rewind a little bit, because this match had some story, a story in it. All right, so Osprey headbutted Swerve right between the eyes. Osprey called for the Tiger Driver. Swerve countered and nailed Will with the hidden blade. Osprey avoided the swerve stomp. Osprey tried for the hidden blade, but Swerve ducked it, which caused Osprey to inadvertently hit ref Paul Turner. Okay. Swerve was quick to take down Will with the Rana, but Will answered with the hidden blade with the visual three there. Os uh, Don Callis appeared to ring style with the screwdriver, which it, it was funny because that seemed like a weird part to bring in the screwdriver because Osprey had clearly pinned Swerve. So what did he need a screwdriver for? Just hit him with the hidden blade again, but whatever. Trying to head into win, Will, Prince Nana shoved Callus to the arena floor, but Will had the screwdriver in his hand. Osprey were reluctant to use the screwdriver until he saw Prince Nana shove, the, the Cal, uh, shove Callus. Osprey jumped out of the ring, put his hands on the Prince Nana, threatening to use the screwdriver on him. Will Ospreay backed away, collected his toss, and, uh, and tossed the screwdriver down. Well, uh, Will returned to the ring, but Swerve was waiting for him with a skull-cracking house call kick. Swerve tried to finish things with the Swerve Stump. Ref Aubrey Edwards ran down to the ring in her Aubrey Edwards swint, sprint, jumped into the ring to count the pin, but Osprey kicked out at two. Swerve tradition quickly, uh, stepping down on Will's arms with his boot. Swerve hit the house call again, right on Osprey's temple. Swerve covered Osprey, and Osprey kicked out again. Osprey staggered up to his feet, falling at Swerve's feet. Swerve smashed Osprey with another house call. Swerve spiked Osprey with a big pressure and pinned Osprey 
What a match, said Jim Ross. And still AEW World Champion Swerve Strickling. Amazing match by both men. Another main event that epitomizes AEW where the best wrestle said. Nigel, Swerve checked on Osprey after the match, a sign of respect. This is the kind of match that makes you proud to be a pro wrestling fan. Jim Ross, heartbreaking loss for Will Ospreay, but he will be back and will be better than ever, replied. Yes. Like, clear five stars to me. Clear would be the match of the year contender if, you know, Will Ospreay didn't wrestle any other matches kind of thing. It was it was a great match. I thought, like, big ending to the show. This is what makes AEW pay-per-views what they are. JR, I will be quiet and let you wax poetic on your thoughts of this match. You know, one of the things about Will Ospreay, and I think when you talk about how great a wrestler is, is every time you see Will Ospreay since he's been in AEW, whether it was in his, his previous uh, pay-per-view matches he's had, or is you're like, oh, he's gonna, it's gonna be a great match. Like you expect there, but then it happens, and it's just like when I talked about expectations earlier. I expect his pay-per-view matches to be a ten, and when it it just seems like it always over delivers. It, because he is one of the best athletes in wrestling history. And what he does, I feel he does better than anybody else currently. And probably history because no, we've never seen athletes like we see today in previous wrestling history. Um, and so when and what he was able to do was swerve. What I enjoyed out of this match was people were very being kind of critical of Swerve's reign so far, like in the first two months, you know, he doesn't seem like a champion. He decided he's not being positioned as a champion. And to me, it was kind of like, okay, let's do this. Let's do this match with Osprey. There was a lot of people thinking Osprey was going to beat Swerve and in his reign quickly. At the end result, Swerve looked so strong beating Osprey. And the way they told the story was that Osprey had a distraction, but it wasn't a significant distraction enough that you could say, like, oh, that's the reason why he lost. It was subtle, it was slight, but it was enough to protect him as being the AW International Champion. And it was not and it was not enough to be like, well, that's the reason why I sort of beat him. They and I love how both men ended the night. Uh, Osprey put on a hell performance, still looks strong, and Swerve looks stronger than I think anybody else has looked um, at, last night. Uh, last night, as we recorded on July first, he, I feel like he took a step up as the AW World Heavyweight Champion, and I will say this: the bar set really high. I think with Swerve matches now. So it's like, okay, if th- as we're going to start transitioning out of this feud, the next war feud has to be pretty significant because him and Osprey set the bar ridiculously high right now. I don't know where he's at, but I want my Sawyer versus Keith Lee match. Damn it. <laughs> I don't think he's the next challenger, but it was just a thought because Keith Lee, the chef MMA fighter, was uh, – was uh, trending today, and they had him confused with Keith Lee from AEW. That's why I thought about him. Kind of crazy. All right. Um, yeah, this match was amazing. A um, couple things from the show. Uh, we got to go back to the Mercedes match. After the Mercedes match, we talked about the Mercedes match, all that kind of stuff. Kind of got off on the tangent, so I forgot to come back to the very, uh, very important thing. As Mercedes standing in the ring with her two belts, doing her dance. I'm doing it right now. You can't see it, but I'm doing it. After the match, the music hits. And dude, when I tell you, I wish I wish Noel was on this review too. So he could tell you. There was a lot of things that were great tonight. But only one thing made me jump out of my chair and go, yes, 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 she's back. D M D Britt Baker made her return to the ring, walked to the ramp. She did this thing where she spinned around and then the fireworks went up and she looked like such a star. 
Oh my God, Miss AEW, the queen of AEW, the head of the women's division, the head of the table of the women's division, Miss Brett Baker is back. The bitch is back. And I meant bitch with all due respect. The bitch is back. Oh my God, I'm so happy. I literally have myself, as I go into it, I'll get to JR in just a second. I literally had myself told JR, t-shirt restriction. I am not buying any t-shirts until after I get back from London. They dropped the doctor's back shirt. I had to drop that money. That was the one exception that I allowed myself. FTR could come out with three student shirts tomorrow. I cannot buy them because I am saving money for London. But I had to get a Britt Baker shirt because she clearly, if you can't hear it in my tone, my favorite women's wrestler. Hey, no disrespect to Willow. I still love you, Willow. You know, you're still my girl. But Britt Baker, she is AEW. The first woman signed to AEW. Let's fucking go. What did you think, JR? You know, um, Britt Baker, that women's division, and, and I say this with as much respect as possible, and to all credit to Tony Storm, who has, I feel, has kept that, that women's division, uh, that train chugging along with the correct work that she has done, which has been great. A lot of people love it. But that Britt Baker is the biggest star in that division. And I don't know if it's because her being an AW original, being the first woman signed, if it's her, the, you know, a lot of people didn't like the character work in the beginning. But I remember to this day at the first, the not the first one, it was the second Jericho Cruise that was taped for Dynamite. And she cut that hill promo and I said, this woman is going to be a star in AEW and she's going to be over and a lot of people thought I was crazy online at the time. And what she's done from that date, this was like late January 2020, it through until she left, you know, recently for whatever reason, is she's the biggest star. And I think the other thing that also helped solidify it was her feud with Soraya in 20, try to math my head, uh, was that in 2021 or 2022, Floyd? Uh, it was 20, I believe it's 22, 2022. Yeah, so because when Soraya attacked Brit, it basically said, like, I created this, this is my house. And all the fans were like, not so fast, woman. That is our AW original. That's our queen. That is our role model, Britt Baker. It elevated her up higher. And I feel like she got the biggest pop of the night. Um, and this is... When you're going to all in and you're trying, you know, to give up to, you know, they have moved forty thousand tickets. They're trying to get to fifty thousand, maybe extend a little bit more. You're gonna need a big match for Mercedes, and there ain't no bigger match for Mercedes than the AEW original, the former AEW Women's Champion, Bird Baker. And I, and the other thing too is Mercedes is like slowly become has slowly started working her way to becoming heel because she's a natural heel. You're gonna very quickly do that with Britt Baker. Britt Baker is gonna make her a heel overnight because Britt Baker is beloved by a by AEW fans, and uh, it's going to be very intriguing how this feud works out. Yes, um, yeah. I was like, they must like when she came out. I was like, oh, they they are really turning Mercedes heel because, simply put, you cannot be a face and go up against Britt Baker. It just doesn't work. I mean, she is just loved in this company. And if she cuts anything near a heel promo, dude, no. They they don't get it. They don't know how much people love her. People love Britt Baker. So, I mean, man, I was so happy. Like I said, not a, a, lot, a lot of good happened last night. A lot great happened last night. But only one thing got me out of my fucking seat. I scared Noel's dog. I jumped up so hard. And I say, let's fucking go. Britt Baker, Dr. Britt Baker, DMED, back. And then something that I won't say that got me equally pumped, but almost as pumped. During the show, Excalibur announces, or they show a video package announcing, on January 4th in Tokyo, at the Tokyo Dome, will be Wrestle Kingdom. Ooh, that's great. That's great. That's every year. 
the next day, January 5th, the answer to Forbidden Door. I mean, they're not not a very creative name, but New Japan Dynasty that will star stars from New Japan, AEW, Stardom, and CMLL, New Japan, the night after their biggest show is show, throwing that all-star game out there. Let's fucking go. Come on, man. Do you know it had me looking up prices to Japan today? They're ridiculous, so I am not going. I'm making that very clear. There's no maybe. The prices are ridiculous. But God damn, do I wish I could go there. Oh, my God. AEW, Dynasty, I mean, New Japan, Dynasty, the Dynasty, four teams. If I'm thinking, if they're doing it the night after New Japan, this is going to be what I wanted Forbidden Door to be. It's more of an all-star type of match, all-star type of show. I want AEW to send their best. I want them to give as good as they get when it comes to Forbidden Door. I want this motherfucker to sell out for New Japan. I am super excited for the show. I hope all my friends have never been to Wrestle Kingdom. This seems like the perfect show to go to because as JR says when we talk about Travis, he always wants more bang for his buck. You get to go to a, a Wrestle Kingdom, which is still on most wrestling fans' bucket list. There is a select few of people, JR included, that have been to Wrestle Kingdom. Then you just get to stay an extra night because it's on Saturday and Sunday. Stay an extra night for Sunday. Go to New, uh, go to uh, Dynasty uh, in the same building. Oh, my God. God damn it. I am so excited. You know, keeping the strong style and keeping the strong style will get the, uh, will have the advantage in this case. They will have the high ground because this is a new Japan show and, uh, AEW would be the guest. So I am really excited to see what they do. What do you think about it, JR? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to say this and they can be considered controversial. If you are, a, if you are a pro wrestling fan, there is only two weeks in wrestling that are the biggest weeks in wrestling. WrestleMania week, Wrestle Kingdom week. When I was in Japan from New Year's Eve through Wrestle Kingdom, uh, and it basically would be New Year's Dash, January 5th. I mean, every company, all, J- uh, all Japan, NOAA, DDT, Stardom, and now... Uh, um, I know Marigold is is a new woman's company, and I feel like I'm missing some somebody else. And then on top, of, if you like combat sports, there's Pancrase and Ryzen that does uh, shows, and that I've seen there's boxing around that time. It is the ending of a, and when people don't understand why it's January fourth, it's the uh, during that time is a very spiritual family time. And it's the ending of one year and the beginning of a new chapter. And so it's like as we're culminating an ending and then celebrating a new beginning, it is just there, you can and you can ride the Tokyo, uh, the Japan uh, subway transit line. You don't have to worry about like travel, you know, having to get flights anywhere. Like it's all within probably an hour of each other of all the different shows going from each different district or prefecture it is going to be a heck, heck, hell of a week if you're going to be at Wrestle Kingdom 19 week, especially with the culmination of Wrestle Dynasty. Um, you know, my wife and I were planning on trying to go to Japan in November, and she was, you know, didn't tell me, do you want to try to, you know, move it back? And, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, looking at that and deciding if we're going to try to go back maybe for New Year's. That, that pr- presents the own separate travel issues trying to go around Christmas and New Year's, but, uh, you know, if, if you have the means and you have the money, I highly suggest this is going to be the year to do it. You know, obviously the first event of its kind is going to be probably the biggest event of its kind. So leave right after Christmas, stay until January 7th, and you're going to see a lot of great stuff with the culminating Wrestle Kingdom and Wrestle Dynasty at the Tokyo Dome. Yeah, I I. I... I hope Wrestle Dynasty ends up being a yearly thing, so I will shoot. I will shoot for twenty twenty six. But yeah, I am really excited for twenty twenty five. I work overnights anyway, so I, you know, I basically I'm up to watch both shows anyway. So that's awesome. 
but I definitely wanted to get that information out there. Uh, and uh, the other piece of news I wanted to get to, uh, I mean, they're out of most sizes now, but go to champsports.com. Uh, uh, AEW and uh, Reebok did a, a, a tribute shoe to Brody Lee, the Exalted One in the Dark Order. Uh, they're black and purple. They're 90 bucks, I believe. They only have like sizes 7 through 11 now. Like 7, all the half size up to 11. Anything over 11 is gone. I mean, anything over 10 is gone. And then, or yeah, anything over 10 is gone. And anything like under 7 is gone. So if you have tiny feet, I feel bad for you. Um, but I mean, honestly, I could see them if they sell out doing a restock. Because they never said it was like super limited. They just, you know. They made of care, so once they sell out, and they might open up some more. So we'll see. Go support Brody Lee. I wear a bigger size, so I missed out on it. Like from the beginning, like I got on at the time, and they were already gone. My size was already gone. Um, but that's I think that's all. Like the like new stuff. Uh, last but not least, we'll do this. Oh, oh Dynamite Grand Slam was announced for. September, uh, it was. It's still going to be a dynamite, which is great. Uh, it's still going to be a dynamite because I was afraid the special dynamite shows might be going away. But we got Beach Bash. Is it called Beach Bash this week? Beach Break. Beach Break this week. We got Blood and Gluts at the end of July, and now we uh, we got uh, th- what is this called again? Uh, Grand Slam coming back in September. This is going to be on Wednesday, September 25th. So be 18 days. Like, this is what you have with the pay-per-views. It's 18 days after All Out. But also about 18 days before Wrestle Dream. <laughs> so it's like right in the middle. Uh, so generally, this is the biggest dynamo of the year. It's basically a pay-per-view on TV. It's at Arthur Ashe Stadium. Uh, tickets are on sale July 18th. Make sure you're a part of the AEW like uh, Insiders fan club to get the uh, tickets information. I won't be going to the show, of course. It's in New York, and you know that'll be like not too long after I get back from London. I'll be really poor when I get back from London. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, as we wrap up the show, so Jr. can actually go to bed because this man has to work in the morning, unlike me. Uh, beach break. We got some big matches. Uh, First of all, we got Jeff Jarrett versus the Elite's wild card. Dude, after that Jeff Jarrett video, as a person that's like, why is Jeff Jarrett on my TV when you have so much talent? I'm, I'm one of those guys. If, uh, if you, uh, like, I like Jeff Jarrett. I've always liked Jeff Jarrett, but I'm like, dude, you have so much talent on your show. Why is Jeff Jarrett getting matches? You know what I mean? And then they did the video. And I was like, okay, I want Jeff Jarrett to win it all in main event Wembley. I like, dude, that's how much a video package like changed my life. <laughs> I was like, the, the, the dude was so good, so earnest. I was like, oh, he has to win. But just like they did with Dax, where they was building up how much he lost, he loved the Hart family and how he was doing it for the Hart family. And then he lo- just got beat. It seems like this might be happening with Jeff Jarrett. Uh, Elite's wild card. We've been seeing vignettes for Hangman. Our Ricochet. Ricochet and Donovan Dijax contracts are up as of yesterday, so they're free agents as of today. Uh, so uh, we got some uh, ideas out there. Jr., who do you think the wild card is going to be? Um, well, from my understanding, Ricochet's contract is not up yet. He's not. He's not like fully cleared yet. From my understanding, I could be wrong. Maybe that dude. Was you know, and, and and that's the problem with Twitter. I don't even know if what I saw was from a, a like a, like an actual you know good place. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I mean it's it's coming close, but I don't I don't think it's here yet. Obviously, Dijak we do know because he said it. His last day with his last contract was up on June twenty eighth. Hangman, Hangman, you know we've seen vignettes. If I were to venture to guess, um... no, no. According to Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful. W, uh, Ricochet's contract has officially expired. He's expected to join uh, AEW. So yeah, that's the one I saw. It's the fightful one. And I haven't seen a retraction. So, 
Who do you think it's going to be? Go back to that. I, I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Hangman. I mean, I just I feel like Hangman is based on especially on that vignette. He looks like he's he's turning. He's he's kind of leaning a little bit, you know, back into you know into a heel, and you know that's who I see. But it could be anybody at this point because we they've they've done some crazy, you know, people that we never even thought about. So I'm gonna say Hangman. I think Ricochet shows up tomorrow. I do. I do think Ricochet shows up. I don't think he's the uh, wild card. I'm going with Hangman. Hangman and Swerve is the match everybody wants for the world title. That's the match everybody wants. I think it should main event all in. I don't know if it will, but I think it should main event all in. I think it's their biggest money match that they have right now. Hangman and Swerve. Uh, that's who people wanted Swerve to be for the world title. <laughs> you know, like they're hot and they're magic together. So that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be Hangman. And yeah, I want him to do something very dastardly to establish himself as the top heel in AEW and beat Jeff Jarrett. So, yeah. Hangman Page. We were both in agreement on that. Then we get the Owen Hart quarterfinal, uh, is a semifinal match with Miss Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale, the love of my life. She knows it. Not really. She doesn't know. She has no idea who I am. But she is the love of my life. Uh, who do you got winning this match, sir? And moving on. I actually have uh, Chris Statlander uh, beating Willow due to some nefarious actions from the outside. Dude, I think it should be Chris Statlander so much. If Willow wins, you should just release Chris Statlander. <laughs> Because that means you're not doing anything with her. You give her this big heel turn. You give her this manager. You're you're like building her up like a million bucks. And to for her to lose like her first significant match, what are you what are you doing? It just doesn't make sense for Willow to win this match. Do you agree with my statement of why Chris should win? <laughs> no, I mean absolutely. I mean it's just and that you know. You gotta pull. You gotta start pulling triggers. Yeah. I mean, you gotta start building up people. I mean, you get to the point where it's like, you know, you know, I don't want to go off on a diet right, but just like, hey, you, you got your own talent. It'd be kind of good to start building up some of these guys yeah. and girls. Yeah. No. No. I completely agree. It's just like I said. It's just like, stamp. Uh, I mean, put a stamp on her butt. And send her to uh, NXT if you uh, if you hate her. Like if you hate her that much, you know what I mean? Because it's just like it just. There's no reason Chris Statlander shouldn't win this match. She should win it cheating, of course, but she should win this match. And of course, Willow should come back one, you know, come back to get her. But for right now, yeah. Then we have the bastard Pac trying to win the Owen Hart tournament so he can main event in his home country of uh, England versus the injured American Dragon Brian Danielson, sir. Who you got? Probably going to be the match of the night, and I'm going to go with Brian Danielson. Uh, you do know Will Ospreay exists, right? Before you say that's going to be the match of the night, right? I stand by my statement. Yeah, okay. Okay, I just... Hey, I had to ask. I had to. Because I'm using it's Brian Danielson and Pac combined as I'm picking. Yes. Then, in what will probably be the main event of the show for the international title... Mr. Will Ospreay, the heart stopper, Will Ospreay. I'm pretty sure when I die, it will be after I watch an Ill or Will Ospreay match that's going to be like eight and a half stars, and I'm just going to get so excited that I'm going to have a heart attack and die. And just know, don't get sad. That is how I want it to go. Okay, just know that. Only thing else is I'm eating a bacon cheeseburger while Will Ospreay is performing, and then I have the heart attack and go. That's the only way we we'll make it better. Um, yeah, so Will Ospreay, I've, this is one of those things. The predictable answer is Will Ospreay wins. This is me going out. This is my going out on a limb. I am 100% wrong. I'm telling you my prediction is wrong before I put my Amber prediction out there. Daniel Garcia joins... Uh, joins the Don Callis family. They cheat, and Don Callis, be, uh, Daniel Garcia 
pins Will Ospreay to be your new AEW International Champion. Breaking Daddy Magic's heart in the process. What do you think, sir? Hey, sometimes you gotta shock the system. Dude. dude. You wanna talk about, like, yeah. Like, he's pissed off Don Callis. Don Callis has been recruiting. So, to me, it's either Daniel Garcia wins, or after Osprey wins, Roosh comes out and attacks Will Osprey, and he joins officially joins the Don Callis family. I feel like somebody's joining the Don Callis family tomorrow. What you, do you have a outlandish prediction? But I threw out my outlandish prediction. Um, you know what? I did think about this that we t- and I don't know the person's health. It could still be bad, which I hope it's not because I love this individual, you know, so much. I did have an idea. You know, we talked about there's a possibility, you know, blood and guts, the elite versus acclaimed. I think you and I talked about there, like, oh, the acclaimed and swerve and a couple other guys. What if the wild card is the one that's been that has never got his revenge on Swerve and that is the limitless one Keith Lee and he ends up becoming a fifth member and enforcer for the elite I mean I've never thought of that but that would be brilliant you want to talk about like you like fixing you fix Jungle Boy and now Keith Lee's been gone and you want to fix him put Keith Lee in the elite the big man of the elite I don't like I say I don't know if he's interested or whatever, but that that's a brilliant idea that I didn't think about. I don't even know if he's healthy, but if he that's is, thing, I don't know. Yeah, brilliant. Know how bad his health is, but it's like you know, he, they, people you know they forgot about it, but they wanted his match against Swerve. They wanted him to get the you know, you know, and that put a bow on that on that rivalry. I know people miss him. I miss him. I I love Keith Lee's work, I, and so I'm just like you know, come back and he's just. Sometimes that's happened. You know, guys left as baby faces and girls and come back as hill because the person they were feuding with before they got injured was the opposite and they switched. I remember one that was a, a, a one that happened in w, WWE a long time ago was a Beth Phoenix meet Melina feud. Melina was a heel. Beth Phoenix was a baby face. She got hurt, was gone. By the time she came back, Melina was a, was a baby face and, and Beth Phoenix came back as a heel. And it's just like, you know, it, and especially because it's like, if we're going into blood and guts, it's like, man, we need a fit guy. And, you know, you want to, you know, big, nasty, big, nasty person, you know, that'd be, that's my outlandish, that's my outlandish sure to go wrong. Absolutely. Thousand to one long shot. Hey, you know what? That's what we're here for. I mean, you could, we, we could go chalk and we could just say everybody that you think is going to win. But why would you listen to this podcast? We're going to give you some outlandish, outrageous, probably not going to happen things just so you can chew on. Just so you can chew on it a little bit. Also on the show, other than those matches, we have two segments that I feel are going to have something to do with each other. Mercedes Monet, double championship celebration, and we'll hear from Britt Baker. What's the odds that those two things happen either at the same time or back to back, JR? You know what? I am. <laughs> If it does, it's one of those things what you and I will be talking and it happens, I will say, I am so shocked. I cannot believe that happened. I, I did not see that coming in my sarcastic tone. Yes, because no, I just have a feeling those two things might happen at the same time. So, yes. So, like right now, I'm looking at Hangman uh, coming back tomorrow from his long hiatus. I'm hoping everything's all right with his family and kids. And he comes back and he kicks ass and just be Hangman. And we can get consistent Hangman for about a year, you know, like consistently without, a, you know, like a big break in between. So we can really get this Hangman, you know, thing in. Because, I mean, honestly... What Brit means to the women's division, Hangman equally bring, uh, means to the men's division. So getting those two back on back-to-back shows would be fucking nuts. Because, you know, when people talk about AEW not being hot, I'm like, dude, some of their established people have been out for a very long time. 
And AEW has a policy. They don't really give a lot of information away about the injuries. They let the wrestlers handle that, which is amazing. I love that policy, but it does make you feel like you did when you were a kid. And remember when you were a kid and you had know all the inside information and then a wrestler would just go away forever? And you're like, what the fuck happened? And your only aspect is to hate the company because they're not putting the wrestler on, not to think that there's like 900 reasons that they could not be working right now. So... It, there is a it, it is versus a good thing and a bad thing when it comes to injuries. So, um, yeah. So that is your dynamite preview. I believe we are done for the show. Uh, Jr. Um, do you want people following you on Twitter? Do you want them? Do you want them? Do you want the yeah. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned in the, in the preview, my uh, Twitter handle is TJF Professor. That is TGIF Professor, named after the old two-hour time lock on ABC TJF Fridays. It's uh, thank you find me there. It says thanks God it's Floyd. We know what it is, sir. We know Calm it's down. a tribute to me. I get it. Okay. <laughs> Stop. I wish everybody. I, I wish everybody has a has a safe and enjoyable Fourth of July week. Um, there's a massive heat wave seen all over America, so make sure you stay hydrated, um, stay stay safe, stay cool. And uh, if you're uh, very light skinned like me, make sure you put on that suntan because uh, we've turned into a Mr. Krabs from uh, SpongeBob. All right, and I have a dog now, so I'm gonna remind you: keep your dogs fucking inside. Don't leave them out in this weather. I will stab you. Okay. Especially I, during Fourth July. With I the am fire. threatening violence about against anybody that uh, messes with their dogs. Like, hey, I'll take your dog. If you don't want your dog, I'll take your dog, okay? I love dogs. Me and Winston. Winston's sitting in the air condition. Winston has his own fan that he sits in front of and sleeps. Because that's how cool my dog has to stay. So, I am that guy with their animal. I am. I am. Shame me. I'm okay with it. Uh, but, yeah, to all, yeah, just make sure everyone have a ha- happy, safe 4th of July Spend time with your family. Spend time with your friends. Again, take care of your animals. Keep them all good. Don't be locking them in the car or some stupid shit like that. But yeah, just appreciate everybody. Celebrate what you celebrate. Fourth of July, it's a free day off. Whether you believe in what the Fourth of July talks about or not, it's a free day off. Enjoy it. Go get some. Go get some ribs. Some. Uh, uh, I'm going over my uncle's house. He's gonna have ribs hamburgers hot dogs it's always a a good time he's always amazing so i'm happy about that and of course my wife gets another day off so i'm always looking out for her i do not get days off because you know i like money um so with that i will leave you how i always leave you thank you jr for being on the show and with that i'll leave you how i always leave you i'll say that again whether it's home work or school always do your best to be elite welcome back brit (laughs) 